gratitude for what he has done today, coming to us for the very first time out of Washington after his terrible accident. May I present to you Dr. Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Father Hesburgh, I thank you very much and for so many things. The distinguished honor that you've conferred upon me here today, I must say, however, compounds a sense of guilt that I have nursed for almost 50 years. I thought the first degree I was given was honorary. <laughs> but it's wonderful to be here today with Governor Orr, Governor Bowen, Senators Lugar and Quayle and Representative Heiler. These distinguished honorees, the trustees, administration, faculty, students, and friends of Notre Dame, and most important, the graduating class of 1981. Nancy and I are, are greatly honored to share this day with you, and our pleasure has been more than, more than doubled because I am also sharing the platform with a long time and very dear friend, Pat O'Brien. <laughs> Pat and I haven't been able to see. It is difficult to explain to anyone who didn't live in those times. The legend was based on a combination of three elements, a game, football, a university, Notre Dame, and a man, Canute Rockman. There's been nothing like it before or since. My first time to ever see Notre Dame was to come here as a sports announcer two years out of college to broadcast a football game. You won, or I wouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> a number of years later, I returned here in the company of Pat O'Brien and a galaxy of Hollywood stars for the world premiere of Canute Rockney All-American, in which I was privileged to play George Gibb. Now, I've always suspected that there might have been many actors in Hollywood who could have played the part better, but no one could have wanted to play it more than I did. And I was given the part largely because the star of that picture, Pat O'Brien, kindly and generously held out a helping hand to a beginning young actor. Having come from the world of sports, I'd been trying to write a story about Canute Studio that employed me was already preparing a story treatment for that film. And that brings me to the theme of my remarks. I'm the fifth president of a great international or national issue that has nothing to do with this occasion. Indeed, this is somewhat traditional. So I wasn't surprised when I read in several reputable journals that I was going to deliver an address on foreign policy. But by the same token, I'll try not to belabor you with some of the standard rhetoric that is beloved of graduation speakers. I don't really go back that far. <laughs> Notre Dame, we're in, because it says something about America. First, that Canute Rockney, as a boy, came to America with his parents from the singular niche in the nation that he carved out for himself, not just in sport, but in our entire social structure. Now today, I hear very often, win one for the Gipper, spoken in a humorous vein. Lately, I've been hearing it by congressmen who are supportive of the programs that I've introduced. 
But um, let's look at the significance of that story. Rockne could have used Gibbs' dying words to win a game any time. But eight years went by following the death of George Gibb before Rock revealed those dying words, his death with dead wish. And then he told the story at halftime to a team that was losing and one of the only teams he had ever coached that was torn by dissension and jealousy and factionalism. The seniors on that team were about to close out their football careers without learning or experiencing any of the real values that the game has to impart. None of them had known George Gibb. They were children when he played for Notre Dame. It was to this team that Rockney told the story and so inspired them that they rose above their personal animosities. For someone they had never known, they joined together in a common cause and attained the unattainable. We were told when we were making the picture of one line that was spoken by a player during that game, we were actually afraid to put it in the picture. The man who carried the ball over for the winning touchdown was injured on the play. We were told that as he was lifted on the stretcher and carried off the field, he was heard to say, that's the last one I can get for you, Gipper. Now, it's only a game, and maybe to hear it now afterward, and this is what we feared, it might sound maudlin and not the way it was intended. But is there anything wrong with young people having an experience, feeling something so deeply, thinking of someone else to the point that they can give so completely of themselves. There will come times in the lives of all of us when we'll be faced with causes bigger than ourselves and they won't be on a playing field. This nation was born with a band of men, their genius individual Americans, men and women, in three and a half seconds would perform such miracles of invention, construction, and production as the world had never seen. As you join us out there beyond the campus, you know there are great unsolved problems. Federalism, with its built-in checks and balances, has been distorted. Central government has usurped powers that properly belong to local and state governments. And in so doing, in many ways, that central government has begun to fail to do the things that are truly the responsibility of a central government. All of this has led to the misuse of power and preemption and prerogatives of people and their social institutions. You are graduating from a great private or, if you will, independent university. Not too many years ago, such schools were relatively free lives. The independent and church-supported colleges and universities have found themselves enmeshed in that network of regulations and the costly that government has demanded. 34 congressional committees and almost 80 subcommittees have jurisdiction over four regulated. Hiring, firing, promotions, physical plant, construction, record keeping, fundraising, and to some extent, so with a feeling of obligation to your alma mater. She'll need your help and support in the years to come. If ever placed by tax-supported institutions, the struggle to preserve academic freedom will have been lost. And we're troubled today by economic stagnation brought on by inflated currency and prohibitive taxes and burdensome regulations. The cost of stagnation in human terms, mostly among those least equipped to survive it, is cruel and inhuman. Now, after those remarks, don't decide that you'd better turn your diploma back in so you can stay another year on the campus. I've just given you the bad news. The good news is that something is being done about all this. Because the people of America have said enough already. You know, <laughs> we who had preceded you had just gotten so busy that we let things get out of hand. We forgot that we were the keepers of the power. 
forgot to challenge the notion that the state is the principal vehicle of social change, forgot the myth that millions of social interactions among free individuals and institutions can do more to foster economic and social progress than all the careful schemes of government planners. Well, at last, we're remembering. Remembering that government has certain legitimate functions which it can perform very well, that it can be responsive to the people, that it can be humane and compassionate, but that when it undertakes tasks that are not its proper province, it can do none of them as well or as economically as the private sector. For too long, government has been fixing things that aren't broken and inventing miracle cures for di unknown diseases. We need you. We need I know that this period of your life, you have been and are critically looking at the mores and customs of the past and questioning their value. Every generation does that. May I suggest, don't discard the time to more important, don't let today's doom criers and cynics persuade you that they're here. Each generation sees farther than the generation that preceded it because it stands on the shoulders of that we've ever known. The people have made it plain already. They want an end to excessive government intervention in their lives and in the economy, an end to the burdensome and unnecessary regulations that can not only continue to send men across the vast reaches of space and bring them safely home, but that can guarantee that you and I can walk in the park or our neighborhood after dark and get And finally, they want to know that this nation has the ability to defend itself against those who would seek to pull it down. So look at those regulations I've spoken of. They have already identified hundreds of them that can be wiped out with no harm to the quality of life and the cancellation of just those regulations will leave billions and billions of dollars in the hands of the people for productive enterprise and research and development and the creation of jobs. The years, the years ahead are great ones for this country, for the cause of freedom and the spread of civilization. The West won't contain communism, It'll transcend communism. It won't bother to dismiss or denounce it. It will dismiss it as some bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages are even now being written. William Faulkner, at a Nobel Prize ceremony some time back, said, man would not only endure, he will prevail against the modern world because he will return to the old verities and the truths of the heart. And then Faulkner said of man, he is immortal because he alone among creatures has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. One can't say those words, compassion, sacrifice, and endurance, without thinking of the irony that one who so exemplifies them Pope John Paul II, a man of peace and goodness and inspiration to the world, would be struck by a bullet from a man towards whom he could only feel compassion and love. It was Pope John Paul II who warned in last years in his cyclical on mercy and justice against certain economic theories that use the rhetoric of class struggle to justify injustice. He said, in the name of an alleged justice, the neighbor is sometimes destroyed, killed, or deprived of liberty, or stripped of fundamental human rights. For the West, for America, the time has come to dare to show to the world that our civilized ideas, our traditions, our values are not like the ideology and war machine of totalitarian societies, just a facade of strength. It is time for the world to know our intellectual and spiritual values are rooted in the source of all strength, a belief in a supreme being and a law higher than our own.